Dr. I. P. S. Obrai is the president of Indian Arthroscopy Society. He'll just welcome you, and after that, we'll soon start. All right, Brian. We just yeah, we just going to connect to, to the uh, delegates, and then we start it. So then we can start. We are now. live. We are live, please. Uh, Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, uh, welcome to yet another webinar of Indian Arthroscopy Society. Uh, this is a wonderful webinar because we have none other than. Uh, the great master of cartilage, uh, Dr. Brian Cole uh, from Chicago joining in. Uh, all thanks to Dr. Deepak Chaudhary, who has been key to get uh, Brian's time. And uh, uh, we have him as his master class for cartilage. May I now uh, ask Dr. Deepak to introduce uh, Dr. Brian Cole, and then we take forward his master class. Deepak. Uh, thank you, Dr. O'Brien. Uh, we all know that the poor regenerative capacity of the articular cartilage has led to innovative approaches to treat symptomatic lesions. The goals of these procedures, whether they are palliative, reparative or restorative, are to decrease the symptoms and return the patient to their normal activity levels. Although major advances have been made in existing cartilage repair technologies, predictable restoration of weight-bearing properties still continues to elude us. With this background, I am I am very pleased to introduce to all of you Dr. Brian Cole, who is an internationally renowned orthopedic surgeon in the field of sports medicine and is presently the chairman and professor of orthopedics at Rush Medical Center, Chicago, and also heads the Cartilage Research and Restorative Center. He has to his credit several innovative techniques for the treatment of shoulder, elbow, and knee conditions, especially the cartilage. He is honored to be the named in top 20 in sports medicine specialty, knee and shoulder specialty, repeatedly over the last five years. His awards range from best doctors in America since 2003 and top doctor in Chicago since 2004. Welcome, Dr. Brian Cole. Please, uh, you can start your presentation with this introduction. Thank you very much. And I hope that you and your families are all safe and healthy. And um, I congratulate you for uh, offering a uh, little bit of a distraction to our daily lives by doing what we all love to do, and that's to learn and to teach. And um, I'm honored to uh, participate and um, hopefully can share some words of wisdom. I'm gonna share my screen. And um, I understand that um, the things I'm going to talk about may not be uniformly available to all of you. Uh, so with that in mind, it's important to understand that um, there are a number of um, techniques that you can do locally that can still achieve a good and excellent outcome. And I would focus on the, the uh, decision-making principles uh, and not as much on these specific techniques because I'm completely sensitive to the fact that you may not have all of these things uh, perfectly available to you at your disposal. Uh, can you see okay the, my, my presentation? Yeah, yeah, you can see. Excellent. So I think the first thing to, to contemplate is how frequent are these uh, problems in all comers. And in general, cartilage lesions across the board are uh, present, forgive me, I'm, I feel like I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> you know, you get that and it's gonna happen. So if it does, just forgive me. I promise to sneeze into my arm so nobody gets contaminated, okay? <laughs> uh, so uh, at the highest level, uh, we speak in the range of 40 to 80% of all comers have some type of pathology. Similarly, we see the same or even higher numbers of individuals uh, who have meniscal lesions. I think the biggest challenge we have is that there's an enormous disconnect between the imaging and how patients present. Uh, this particular MRI is a great example where the radiologist is reading that he has a contusion and a stress fracture when he never had an injury, he just presented with knee pain, the physician referred him for imaging, and this is the read. And I would argue that we see this frequently and, and we spend a lot of our time trying to figure out what's relevant and what's not. And it's, it's very interesting how patients can choose to value the MRI more than the wisdom, wisdom that you and I bring to the table. And that doesn't mean that the MRI is inherently beneficial to our health, as Lisa Rosenbaum have cited. So in many instances, we're dealing with technology over reason. Case in point, this is an individual whose MRI is seen on the left and the time of arthroscopy is seen on the right. And we honestly see it both ways. The imaging can underrepresent or overrepresent what we see, but all the while it's important for us to focus on the clinical issue and not on what the imaging tells us. Said another way, we treat people, not MRIs. The other thing that imaging 
imaging has become particularly important for us is that we have become aware of the subchondral condition. And suffice it to say, the subchondral condition, whether there's edema, sclerosis, osteophytes, or other, may or may not be relevant in terms of our treatment decisions, but it speaks to load. And I would argue that talking about edema as a lesion should be uh, a, a change in narrative. And we should rather think about how bone marrow findings are suggestive of load and may or may not be clinically relevant, but it also speaks to the kind of solutions we choose when the subchondral plate has changes. And that is often related to previous treatments. But more importantly, patient, patients respond clinically to load and load parameters re, uh, are represented sometimes, but not always by imaging findings, whether it's bone scan or MRI. It's important to think before we treat. And I, I indicate that when we look at long-term studies, for example, using the ACL as the surrogate, we see that patients who have lesions at the time of ACL reconstruction can do very well at long-term follow-up when those lesions are neglected, assuming they were asymptomatic at the time of their ACL reconstruction. It's also important to know that some patients can be made worse if these lesions are treated when they're not causing clinical problems. So our business should be in the setting of treating the here and now and not what might further happen downstream as we do not have a very good understanding of natural history of these lesions. What's also become abundantly clear is we don't even understand why people hurt. This is a, a high level college woman athlete who has a femoral condyle lesion that was treated with marrow stimulation. It represents greater than 50% of the diameter of her femur. She still has pain despite a marrow stimulation. Her femoral condyle is relatively small and that defect is no more than about 14 millimeters in diameter. The only way I was able to make her pain free was to replace that fibrocartilage with an osteochondral allograft. So the point is that we have to look at a lot of different factors to understand why people hurt. One of them may be the relative area that's intact or normal. And in this case, it's pretty small on the medial side, but there's other things like BMI, like alignment, meniscal status, ligament status, all of those factors weigh into our decision-making. So when we're talking about symptoms, we should look to the periphery and say, what are all of these things and how do they weigh in to our ultimate, ultimately to our treatment decision-making principles? What you will, are frequently asked is, look, if our patients remain active, will it make the condition worse? And we know from uh, prevalence data in marathoners that they actually have a positive of subchondral change over time and cartilage change over time. And truth be told, when we look at our literature that we have an insufficient evidence that suggests that sports will increase the prevalence or progression of osteoarthritis. So we are left to looking at patient age, family history, and previous history of surgeries, which might be predictive of how the level of activity relates to the progression of disease. It is also imperative that we think of body mass as the sixth vital sign. So in my opinion, joint preservation really starts in the kitchen. And we know that patients like this that I show you, a wonderful woman who complained of anterior knee pain, who I told her that, look, I understand you have cartilage loss in your patella, but you will do more predictably well if you do strength, conditioning, and weight loss. And in fact, she did just that. And that's her nine months later on the right when she went to Disneyland with her children without knee pain and with a much better physical habitus simply by taking into consideration her physical condition and her body mass with no surgery and no injections. And now no knee pain despite having cartilage loss in her patella. When we talk to our patients, they often have concerns for the past, for the present and the future. And the reason they sit here with us in the present is largely due to genetic determinants, things that they really can't control but you can provide them uh, a sense of well-being by helping educate them to say, look, there's nothing you really did that brought you here today. And most of this is a progressive degenerative phenomenon and maybe with a few other factors that interplay. They also have concerns that if you do not treat them today, that their future will be altered. And it's important to understand that given our poor understanding of the natural history of these issues, that be, that treating them because of their fear of what might happen tomorrow in the absence of symptoms today may not be justified. 
and most of us are in the business of educating patients. And that speaks to this concept of, that the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. And this is a very important principle because when you think about your day-to-day -day lives in the office with anything that we deal with, whether it's a rotator cuff tear, osteoarthritis of the hip, degenerative changes in the spine, when people are in pain, they have concern. And helping them understand that their activity levels do not necessarily relate to the progression of their disease, that they can coexist with their disease. And I will tell you, I, that's something when I've, I've having had the pleasure and uh, privilege of visiting your country on several occasions, um, people coexist with lots of disease. I see lots of people with rotator cuff arthropathy and the inability to bring their arms over their head and they are doing just fine. So the point is, and I see a lot of people walking around with various knees with known osteoarthritis. And because various countries have available resources compared to others and so forth, um, that the societies make decisions with and for patients for better or worse. And the ability to live with disease is an important tenant. When it comes to articular cartilage, we are in the business of treating those who are symptomatic. We are not in the business yet of changing the natural history. So who gets what? Who gets non-operative operative treatment? Who gets operative treatment? Those who have the acute onset of pain, whose performance is maintained, or maybe their performance is compromised, but they're playing for a contract those are the ones who we often will offer non-surgical treatment to remedy their current condition. But when their performance is impaired and they fail non-operative treatment and they're early in very expensive contracts, though where they have time to get better, those are often the people who we relegate to the surgical category. We have a number of safe, maybe not proven, but safe alternatives to modify symptoms, all of which should be part of our practice armamentarium. And I think we should never forget that the placebo effect is very important. I would argue that all of you on this webinar have various ability to relegate the placebo effect to your patients. This is a study where we looked at the therapeutic effects of saline in level one studies. We did a meta-analysis just to see how good saline did when compared to hyaluronic acid or corticosteroids or PRP. And what was interesting is that those who met the MCID were about the same percentage when all of these studies compared it to things like PRP, lubricant, and so forth. And that the degree of change was very similar. So the point is that the placebo effect is very important. These are the decision-making pearls when making decisions in cartilage repair. It summarizes a lot of the things I just said and what I will say. We need to separate patient concern from real disability. The inability to perform makes an athlete either unable to obtain an education if they're on a scholarship or maybe unemployed if that's their job. The treatment that you choose may affect their asset value. So I operate under the premise to consider the least amount necessary to make them well. Improvements in their activities of daily living are predictable, but their ability to return to sport with the treatments that you and I will do is less so. We must match the solution to the anticipated outcome and the time required to feel better to the athlete's available timeline. We need to choose solutions that do not burn important bridges. And finally, their past re responsiveness and performance predicts future responsiveness and performance. If they can get back to the season, despite the nature of the condition, if they can get back for an entire year, their asset value can improve and stabilize. So the past year, of wellness following treatment can predict their future value when you're dealing with higher level individuals. So the day of reckoning, when we decide surgery to get someone from the bench to the court is that they have failed non-surgical treatment. They have unacceptable pain and dysfunction. We need to ask them what they would like to see improve and will the solution provide meaningful upside with minimal risk? It's important that we manage our patient expectations a lot of what we do can provide a light switch. In other words, turn it off, turn their pain off and their function up to normal. But when it comes to Carlos repair, it is often a rheostat. It dims the light. It improves, but does not eliminate their pain. It improves their function, but not necessarily to normal. And what they wanna know is not, did they meet their MCID, the minimally clinically important distance, the difference in a statistical way. They want to know if their goal of returning to activity, maybe a goal of returning to sport will be met. 
And that is as much of an art as it is a science. These are the surgical options. And these are the numbers of each of them being performed in the United States. The bereavement is up in the neighborhood of 400,000 per, per year, as opposed to osteochondral allografts, where we do have availability in the neighborhood of 3,000 per year. And I understand that all of these treatments may or may not be relevant or present in your lives. We used abridement for first line treatment for the in season athlete, lower demand patients who have mechanical symptoms. We use marrow stimulation, sometimes augmented with biocartilage or a procedure called autocart for larger defects, but not too large, generally in the neighborhood of two to four square centimeters. We use the Astrocon autograph for very high demand patients. And I use Macy for young patients with multiple defects or for patellofemoral lesions. And I use allograft tissue like de novo or cartiform as an alternative to ACI for patellofemoral lesions. And I still use the Astrocon allograft as my mainstay of treatment, especially when combined with other treatments like meniscal transplants. Please keep in mind that malalignment and meniscal deficiency are very important parameters that you need to consider, and it's not just the cartilage defect. What really happens is debridement, and maybe debridement again, and then maybe marrow stimulation, and then osteochondral grafting, and then what I call poly treatment. In other words, doing some type of graft with meniscus, osteotomy, and cartilage treatment. The fate of patients who do not undergo implantation following ACI taught us a lot about the role of debridement. 44% of my patients who were supposed to be implanted with ACI did not undergo implantation because they reported symptom relief with debridement. The other thing that we've learned is that if you create a vertical wall, the defect can better shoulder the load biomechanically. So it speaks to that load concept when I showed you that high level soccer player who had the defect in the femoral condyle treated ultimately with an osteochondral allograft. If you can create a more biomechanically hospitable environment, they may tolerate their problem and never need cartilage repair. There is data that shows that isolated defects, irrespective of size, as long as that the meniscus is intact, can do well with debridement. So the comorbidities matter with debridement. Keep in mind that some people can be made better if you perform it. Marrow stimulation has been shown in very high level athletes if you follow the principles of rehab to get them back to sport in excess of 75%. We have also found that micro drilling compared to micro fracture can do better than micro fracture when, when considering lesions of appropriate size. In fact, our revision rates were 41% when we use a micro fracture all versus 17% when we drilled. As an adjunct to micro fracture, you can consider a scaffold. This is an allograft and you may not have access in your country, but micronized allograft is a scaffold has been shown to improve the outcomes of marrow stimulation when it's combined with PRP. And in fact, our data showed that the MRI repair scores, that the arthroscopy scores and type two collagen staining, staining was better when we combined a defect that was treated with microfracture or drilling and we combined it with uh, 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 dehydrated articular cartilage collagen with PRP we did better, and fibrin glue, we did better than microfracture alone as an adjunct to marrow stimulation. This is a 24 year old NFL football player who has years of medial knee pain, who was unable to continue his sport with an osteochondral lesion. He was treated with drilling and he was treated with biocartilage with bone marrow concentrate. And this is his defect. One year later, and this is him performing one year later, and you can see repair tissue and his ability to perform high level sport uh, through just a basic video demonstration one year later. This is another technique. This is a technique where we take articular cartilage from the intercondylar notch. We call it autocart. This is a device that you can get in your country called GraphNet. We harvest the cartilage from the intercondylar notch like you see here. We want to look at our the cartilage is then placed in a mixture of biocartilage and PRP or bone marrow concentrate and injected into the defect. And I just don't, the videos, the audio is running. So I, I'm, uh, hang on. I just don't want to distract you with the audio. Let me just, let me just bring it down. So you don't have to be distracted by that and then play it. So you can see the, the procedure being performed here where arthroscopically we inject a mixture 
of autologous cartilage, biocartilage, and PRP into the defect that's been prepared as a way to improve the quality of fibrocartilage fill using autogenous tissue. It's very economically responsible and it can be performed arthroscopically and it doesn't require anything from a regulatory process to approve it. So you can do this now with autologous tissue. Oats is still a dominant treatment strategy for small defects in highly active patients, even compared to microfracture, if you do indeed get a patient with a small defect. Macy also has very good long-term data for return to sport, commonly in the patellofemoral joint, but also femoral condyle, and that we have shown return to play in up to th two thirds of patients who undergo autologous condyset implantation. There's a number of different types of allograft tissue as you see here. And I will tell you that an osteochondral allograft remains my go-to in the United States for treating cartilage defects. This is a very high level individual with a trochlear defect that we treated with an osteochondral allograft. We now have over 800 patients treated in this fashion. It is not available everywhere, but when it is available, it has become the gold standard for a primary revision treatment for osteochondral lesions, especially in a setting of, of meniscal deficiency. Our return to sport rates are 75 to 88% in this population. We are also looking at larger degenerative defects with different instrumentation like ovals that you can see here in something called a bio-uni to replace very large areas of cartilage loss rather than using two plugs adjacent to one another. Meniscal allografts, this is a young woman who had an intact articular cartilage who underwent a complete medial meniscectomy. On the bottom is her post metastectomy arthroscopy. And what you see here is progressive bipolar disease. She was treated with a meniscal allograft, sorry, a meniscal allograft and an osteochondral allograft and ended up being symptom free at one year. We know we can return patients to uh, following these treatments with cumulative return to sport at 75 to 85%. Very high level individuals also can respond favorably to realignment procedures. This is another professional football player with a cartilage lesion of the femoral condyle and varus with, slight, uh, with, with meniscal deficiency. But because he is going back to a high level of sport, we simply elect to, re to restore the articular surface with an osteochondral graft and an osteotomy and was able to return to play. We know that the results after osteotomy can be very favorable. And we look at this as the lowest hanging fruit to return someone back if they have a cartilage problem. We can get high level athletes back with osteotomy alone, in fact. So these are the key takeaways. It's important to know exactly what your patients want. Skillful neglect is an acceptable treatment algorithm in appropriate cases. You must assess the extent to what the patient comprehends when you're educating these individuals and ask them, do they understand it? What would they like to achieve? They must Patient, the plan must meet their expectations and or improve function. It is generally not considered preventative in nature. Outcomes are inversely related to demand. Keep that in mind. The higher the demand, the less successful you will be in achieving the patient's expectations and goals. So thank you. And I'm happy to take a few minutes of questions. If you have them, maybe you are using chat room or other, uh, but I'll stay online for a few minutes and answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Brian Cole. Uh, yeah, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, yeah, Brian, Brian, can I ask you one question? If you are uh, doing an ACL reconstruction and during that you find a lesion which is about two centimeter, it is extending till the subchondral bone, the bone bed is not being breached, but patient is asymptomatic. Would you, as you said, many, many times you would neglect it, but don't you feel that such cases might progress further and cause uh, problems? So what would be your take on that? So if it's an asymptomatic defect, I debride it only. And I use my experience to tell me that I have had patients who undergo marrow stimulation at that stage become symptomatic. I have to modify the rehab significantly. I think it's important that for us to get a perfect result with an ACL reconstruction. It is already associated with enough outcome variability. And that if they become symptomatic, I, I will come back and treat it. So my general treatment is for the asymptomatic lesion, like you're describing, to offer no treatment whatsoever other than debridement. That's my answer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Brian, a wonderful presentation. Couple of questions, Brian, here. Uh, one question is, Brian, would you prefer to do a micro fracture or a nano fracture or a power pick? 
So if given a choice, uh, which is the best one? For... I think they are probably all biologically equal. Okay. As long as you're drilling. And my preference is uh, power pick only because it's easy, but there is an expense associated with it. So you have to take that in consideration. I don't think there's anyone who's demonstrated advantage of one over the other. I just want it to be simple, easy, and relatively uh, inexpensive, but I don't use an all any longer. Perfect. Uh, what is your take on abrasion uh, arthroplasty? So just debridement and abrasion. So would you still do a subcondral abrasion or you just maybe balance think, it and then microfracture? Yeah. I think abrasion arthroplasty is a viable alternative to drilling. The reason we don't do it frequently as a substitute for marrow stimulation is because it's harder to do to make it perfect without really causing undulations in the bone. If it's a debridement, I will sometimes cheat and try to get through the subcondyl plate aggressively, but I don't treat them like a microfracture rehab wise. So I'm trying to get some additional benefit of getting the marrow stem cells, but I'm not calling it a microfracture. The other advantage of that is if you have a high level athlete, unfortunately, microfracture is sometimes a bad word when it comes to giving them returning their asset value. So I think yeah. you can give them some clinical benefit without doing a microfracture if you believe debridement will help them. I think if we, you and I had a choice, I might argue that doing an abrasion arthroplasty is a better operation than microfracture, but we have a tough time doing it perfectly well without over traumatizing the subcondyl plate, if that so makes would sense. You, would you just use a bar to do a subcondyl abrasion or do you have a special instrument to do I, it? I like, I like a bone cutter because I can use one instrument and I can use it on forward and a bone cutter will actually do a beautiful job of creating a smooth surface, but don't take it for granted. A bone cutter can be very aggressive on the bone as well. So when I do a notch plasty, you see, I don't even use a burr anymore because I'm trying to save money. So for acromioplasties, for notch plasties, I use a bone cutter that can work like a shaver and a burr at the same time for half the price. Perfect. And would you actually augment these cases with a BMAC uh, as an adjuvant? I like BMAC. I think it makes sense. There is no data right now that it's making marrow stimulation better. It costs money. It is not reimbursed. So you could argue that no downside might help its patient obligation here in the United States. So the discussion with patient is, look, insurance considers it experimental and or investigational. They will not pay for it. I, if you would like to do it, it's only money. And if you're willing to do it, I won't hurt you most likely. I might help you, but I, you also need a very good operation at first. Maybe this will help that operation with no assurances. So, but what's your data? Does BMAC actually improves the scores at, at the end of the day? I don't have the data. Okay, perfect. Uh, uh, you said about subchondral bone, Brian. Uh, how important is subchondral bone for you to decide whether this patient would just need an abrasion or a microfracture? Or is it just the size of the subchondral bone uh, which is important? I think it's important when you're talking about subchondral bone not to confuse edema with subchondral bone. Okay. Edema is a response to load. It is not an adverse situation that will compromise the outcome. In other words, it shows you that load is being transmitted to the subchondral bone region. So you can still treat someone with Macy, for example, who has had a marrow stimulation if the subchondral plate doesn't have osteophytes or is not sclerotic. I would not do a surface treatment like a Macy or an allograft surface like Tardiform or other or De Novo NT for someone who has subchondral change. But if they have edema, I would still consider it. It is not our responsibility or obligation to get rid of all the edema. Our responsibility is to pay attention to the tide mark, the surface, the sclerosis, osteophytes, that dictates how you treat these patients. So if they have a lot of that form, I would say that surface treatments like Macy are not as good of an option unless you plan to eliminate them. I would argue that microfracture is not a good of an option because that's a surface treatment. I would say if you have a lot of osteoarthritic change in that defect, you should be thinking osteochondral allograft. If you have edema in the absence of those changes, you have the luxury of deciding whatever you want to use. So how on an MRI do you differentiate between uh, uh, ischemia there or uh, it's uh, just a reaction to the uh, over pressure on that side? The answer there is that you can make subtle differences between T1 and T2. That being said, it's fluid. If it's very geographic and isolated toward the surface, that is usually a dysvascular phenomenon. 
if it's very spread with more concentration at the surface, but it's, it's sort of a blush that filters away, that is more likely edema and not a dysvascular phenomenon. That being said, there's definitely an overlap between the two of them. That's my most common sense answer. Absolutely. Uh, people are interested about your technique, which you showed, and I think that's uh, commercially available and possible in India. Uh, taking uh, a part of cartilage from the intercondylar notch and then concentrating it and then impacting it. Can you just yeah. maybe brief it again for everybody? Because yes. a lot of chat questions are coming on that side. Yeah, I'm glad because this is an opportunity for you to treat people. And that's one of the reasons I actually helped develop this. It's a very inexpensive device called GraftNet. It's made by Arthrex. This is a device that um, will capture, it's basically like a Lucan's trap that will capture from a shaver on oscillate from the intercondylar notch or from the ridge of the trochlea. It goes into the receptacle. I take it out and I mix it as a paste with biocartilage or just bone marrow concentrate or PRP. I dry the lesion. I may do some drilling. I pack it in place. I know the cells are viable because we've done the work to show cell viability. We put fiber and glue commercially available, TIS seal or EVA seal over the top of it. We hold off on weight bearing for six weeks. We hold off on motion for 48 hours and then we let them go. It is a way to do a poor man's transplant, if you will, as an adjunct to marrow stimulation. Perfect. And you always do it arthroscopically or is it a mini arthrotomy? I try, but do what works for you. I don't think it matters. Stay out of the vastus. Don't injure the vastus medialis. Do a vastus sparing approach. Anything trochea patella or lateral, do it through a lateral retinacular release so you don't have to go into the muscle or the tendon. That's my approach. Uh, doesn't one have, question. Doesn't, I have to be arthroscopic. And would you have to go back in some of these patients and do a cartilage biopsy? And does it show you a fibro or a hyaline cartilage? How, how, how is the quality of cartilage there? If this is fibrous cartilage, fibrocartilage from microfracture, and this is hyaline cartilage from an osteochondral allograft, it's in here. Oh, that's great. So it's something in between. Uh, no yeah, better than this and worse than this. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a very good news, actually, for all uh, of us. Yeah, yeah. Deepak. Okay. Uh, Brian, one question. If uh, on the preoperative assessment, uh, uh, you have decided uh, to do an ACI on a particular patient, but that patient also needs uh, an osteotomy and ACL reconstruction plus a meniscal repair. So in, how will you stage your procedure? In the first sitting, you will just take the biopsy. Or how, what will be your plan of action? Um, I would, it, it, it depends on a hard one. So it depends on what they tell you the primary problem is. That being said, you need an intact meniscus and ACL to do all the other things to get them less painful. So I basically often think about their rehab program and the procedures that are vulnerable to rehab changes. If that's a meniscal repair, not a transplant, is that what you said? Meniscal repair, right? Meniscal repair, yeah. I would repair. do, a, in that patient, in a primer especially, I would probably do a meniscus repair and an ACL first. I would rehab them, and if they continue to have pain, come back at four months or later and do their osteotomy, cell transplant. That's probably what I would do. There's a lot of different permutations. What I wouldn't do is a cartilage transplant in the setting of an ACL deficient knee. What I would like to do is have an ACL rehab and get as perfect an ACL outcome as I could possibly get. I also know that giving people a stable knee and fixing their meniscus might get rid of their pain. And maybe you don't have to go back and do the osteotomy and the ACI or other because you stabilize their knee and you fist their meniscus. So those, that's my thinking with that population. But if that's a virus knee, don't you think that also could be corrected in the same sitting because that will place unless un, uh, unusual loads on the ACL as well as on your meniscal repair. Yes, for sure. In a primary ACL though, I am not treating, I, my threshold to do osteotomy in the varus knee and ACL deficient knee, I won't do it as a primary ACL. For 23 years, 200 ACLs a year, I've never done it. My failure rate's less than 5% that I know of. I will tell you that failed ACL and a varus knee is a different story because then you're trying to eliminate the chance of failure. Obviously, you might argue that the differentiator is the pain and that's an opportunity to, prevent, to give you a better ACL outcome when it otherwise might not occur and you get 
the added benefit of treating their pain. I would never criticize anyone for doing a primary error, uh, osteotomy at the time of an ACL reconstruction uh, for it, with that rationale. I think that's rational. I just generally wouldn't do it. I tend to separate primary ACL, high likelihood of success from the treatment of cartilage. However, that, that narrative gets very blurred when you're talking about a failed ACL and a varus knee. If there are those of you who are doing varus corrections because we learned from the European experience that correcting varus is important to protect your ACL, I don't have a problem with it. I just, at this stage of my life and my career, I've gravitated towards doing less, not more, uh, and still feel like our outcomes are good. Thank you. Uh, Brian, is there something new which you're doing with the osteochondral desiccants, the OCD lesions? Are you still fixing them with some kind of screws or you're just taking them off and uh, doing your uh, uh, allograft? Uh, in some of yeah, so things. basic algorithm for OCD. I ignore asymptomatic OCD. I do not drill them, I ignore them. I let people do what they wish with asymptomatic OCD, even if it looks vulnerable. If it looks very vulnerable, I fix them whenever possible. <clears throat> I think of them as fracture non-unions. I elevate them arthroscopically, cure at the base, and I drill them with a power pick. I always use metal screws. I use metal screws because biocomposite screws can be as dangerous as metal screws, and they take forever to go away. If the piece settles, the biocomposite screw can become dangerous to the tibia. So I go back at eight weeks and I take them out. If it's not healed, I remove the piece. If it's not a particularly vulnerable OCD, I let them go back to sports. If I had to remove the piece when removing the hardware at eight weeks, if I go back and it's fully healed and I remove the hardware, they can go back to sport in eight more weeks, giving them 16 weeks time to fully heal it. They are non weight bearing between the time of hardware replacement and hardware removal defects that I get in there and I have to remove and they're not fixable, I let them return immediately to sports unless it's a very vulnerable area. Vulnerable ones are very large lateral femoral condyles and very large medial typical OCDs. I watch them very closely and have a lower threshold to come back and do a primary OA graft even with low level symptoms. Defects that are intact where you actually go in and think you're in the wrong knee because you get in and you're like, I see it on MRI and I don't see the defect. You're like, oh my goodness, am I operating on the wrong knee? That's the time I use a biocomposite screw. I drill from the side, and I use a biocomposite screw and I bury it. I put it deeper because I think that those still don't do predictably well drilling alone. And I think they hurt because while macroscopically you can push on them and they don't move, microscopically they probably move and they hurt. Therefore, I think giving them some stability is a benefit. And it's pretty innocuous to put a biocomposite screw in. Hopefully that algorithm makes sense. I rarely will ever come in primarily with an osteochondral allograft. I always give them a chance to fail. Yeah, yeah that's a good conclusion to it. Uh, are, uh, how is your uh, experience with your commercially based uh, scaffolds like HaloFast and stuff like that? Once you have uh, availability of an osteochondral graft as well. So, I mean, how do you choose or you still do some uh, cell based and then the scaffold bases? artificial, yeah. uh, commercially available, hylofast and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, in the United States, all we have available is Macy as a cell-based technology. So I'm always left to differentiate between Macy and um, uh, an osteochondral allograft in that setting. So that's a narrow-minded answer. We will have another company that will probably get to the FDA in the next couple of years, and I'll have to, well, I'll have to think about it, but it'll be a cell-based technology. Uh, but I would argue in Europe, they've done very well with the AMIC procedure with a collagen membrane and just marrow stimulation. So I'm not sure you need cells, to be quite frank, in every instance. And I think uh, you said microfracture itself which is going to generate some cells anyway. So That is correct. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm anti-microfracture for very large defects, uh, just because I think the tolerance of a, a lesion to feel better with fibro cartilage repair tissue is maybe more subject to failure. Uh, but I'll consider it still. Just remember, microfracture doesn't give you license to ignore comorbidities. Okay, if they're medical deficient, you shouldn't expect a microfracture to work. You said in your presentation, a couple of your patients, you took a uh, graft and sent it for cultures and the patient never came back for the second surgery for, uh, uh, for an ACI. So, during the first step itself, you did some microfractures and... Uh, no, I debrided. I, no, good question. I debrided them only. You just debrided them? Yeah. So, which is a good news, actually. So, if we are debrading or maybe microfracturing a couple of these cases, they're going well. So, it's, it's a good news then. It is good news and you should never throw... It's like throwing away massive rotator cuff repair because we have SCR. 
you yeah. should not throw away a massive cuff repair because you have an SCR opportunity. It still has an option. So uh, tell us something about BioUni. I mean, this is something which is uh, very close to you because you've done extensive work into it. Uh, how long is your follow up with BioUni and stuff like Bio that? BioUni is an alternative uh, instrumentation to using cylindrical plugs. I'm still uh, learning about it and I don't have a big experience. I think architecturally it allows you to at least to the naked eye make it look good for oval degenerative defects. I'm still learning. Uh, I think in in conceptually it's a good idea, but we don't have good outcomes yet. That's the best I can answer you. You still have the opportunity to treat those defects with overlapping graphs, like I showed you that picture. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, if the uh, for surgeons which uh, in India suppose we don't have an uh, allograft which is available, so how much autograft would you? Uh, uh, is allowed for us to take during an OT. Yeah, and do you crazy. find it is yeah. uh, it's usually a suprapatellar area or is it the intercondylar notch also? And how do you mix and match it? Yeah, uh, give me one second. I'm I want to I, I want to make sure that I, so right now it's uh, nine thirty in the morning in Chicago, um, and I'm in the middle of my clinic. Okay. So I want to just make sure I'm people are not throwing stones at me. Hold on one <laughs> second. Just yeah, give sure, me sure, five seconds. Yeah. No worries. No worries. <laughs> Shall we continue the discussion further, sir? No worries, he's just going to come back. I think. Uh, is there any other question? I mean, uh, yeah, Ranjit, you are there, there, and I think questions. we can raise hand and ask. Uh, Tanmay is uh, also I have one. So yeah, one Pratik one. is also here. So let him come. Uh, let him answer the question uh, which we have put in, and then uh, maybe. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. I just Perfect. was wondering. You know, the interesting thing is our, and I don't know. I'd be, I'd love for someone to share with me what's happening in your country or your local region. But you know, we're. Uh, not yet open for elective surgery, but we're doing time sensitive surgery, but patients are still afraid to come in. In my clinic right now, normally I see 85 to 90 patients. Uh, I have uh, 17 pace, patients spread out over, over uh, eight, uh, six hours today. It's not particularly gratifying. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I, after I answer this question, I, want, I have some more time, it's okay. I'd, be, I'd love it if someone would share with me what's going on uh, in, in, in your country and in your region. Uh, to answer your question, um, I recognize that Ashkana Autograft is a good option when you don't have allografts available, and I would encourage you to responsibly use it. My experience has been the mosaic plasty has been less uh, predictable when there's a large number of small diameter plugs, which is what you would typically get from the intercondylar notch. There's just more units that can fail. And early on when people were doing them, I was scoping patients, and they would have a number of plugs that were delaminating. So uh, that being said, uh, if you say who's the best patient, it's the very active individual who has a 10, 11 millimeter defect, maybe that's failed mineral stimulation or maybe as primary treatment. That's the perfect patient. But I think what you're asking is in your country, you don't have access to osteochondral allografts. What can you do? And what are the limits? And I don't have an absolute answer. I think that, you know, proximal trochlea, you know, eight millimeter grafts, nine millimeter grafts, 10 millimeter grafts, if you take them up proximal and high, it's pretty safe without causing comorbidities. And you can go a long way and stretching the limits of osteochondral autographs in your country. It wouldn't be my first treatment in a setting where I have access to an allograph, but I would argue that I would still keep that in your treatment algorithm. And you would be well served to, to consider using it as a solution. Is there a place, uh, I mean, which part of the femoral condyle would you actually put something which is from intercondylar notch and which part of femoral condyle would you put something which is from the suprapatellar region? So well, you can a... only go so big in the notch, you know, so you get a lot of, create a license to take a bunch of small six millimeter sticks of cartilage and bone from the notch. If you go much bigger than a six, you start to get over the weight burning zone. I can easily take an 11 in the proximal lateral trochlea, even though we published the medial trochlea, I never go there. So I always take the, because it's too small. So the lateral trochlea, while the loads are smaller on the medial trochlea, you only got about 15 millimeters of cartilage for the average patient. So I like the lateral proximal up high. And it seems that we're not getting a, a lot of patellofemoral pain in those patients. And any so you experience with something like a mega oats, I mean, a posterior condyle, if you can do an orthotomy and get a... Yeah, I think if you're able to do that, you know, there's very good data. That area does not see tons of weight. Although in, in certain, you know, look, in your culture, if you, if, or in any culture, if they pray on their knees, I will tell you, obviously, the very far, it's like a Hoffa's fragment. That area doesn't see load unless you depend on it in your lives. And if you pray on your knees or, or yoga or other things that people want to hyperflex their knee, that area will see load. So it's just something to consider. Yeah, perfect. I think Pratik has a question. So Pratik, if you can just. 
Yeah, Brian, thank you so much for this nice talk. Just one, uh, your uh, experience, like you showed one where there was a mismatch between the MRI and the arthroscopy, the whole cartilage was coming out like a cap. If you were to see in a young person with an ACL, you've gone down to the ACL, and you see there's no con there is only chondral uh, cap which has come off, which is about uh, 12 to 15 millimeter by 10 millimeter. What would be your approach? You would like to fix it there and then, or you would do, so what would be your and you have experience with this kind. Yeah, I mean, again, um, certainly if it's very big, uh, I'm fine ignoring it because uh, uh, I don't have the solution off the shelf to treat very big lesions. So if I get in there and it's very big, but you commented on a small lesion. Look, if you say I get in and I'm surprised by a 10, 11 millimeter defect, I just want to do an oats. I don't think it's irresponsible. I would tell you that the literature has only looked at marrow stimulation as potentially compromising outcomes for asymptomatic defects. It hasn't looked at anything else. I also know that Bobic, when he first published his work of OATS, those very large series with very high success rates, a vast majority of those were in ACL deficient patients. They had no symptoms. So of course he had high success rates. So I would argue that you have a lot of room to do whatever you want here in the asymptomatic patient with a small defect. It debris it and ignore it. And if it becomes symptomatic, come back and deal with it later treat it, but please keep in mind that you are now exposing a patient who was asymptomatic to potentially developing pain. And you're also asking them to compromise the rehab with their ACL reconstruction. So you have to, there's a cost to every decision you make. The cost of neglecting it is a second surgery. The cost of treating it is causing a problem they didn't have before. Sure. Uh, Tanmay, any question? Yeah, Satish, please. Uh, Yes, uh, Dr. Brian, uh, what is your uh, threshold for treating the patellar chondral defects? Whether you will do a abrosion chondroplasty, oats or uh, allograft? And my second question is, uh, many times in a uh, oat, I um, mean uh, OCD, there is a soft cartilage covering whole defect. So, do you recommend removing that soft cartilage and drilling or uh, oats, or uh, you just drill through that uh, soft cartilage? Okay, first question of patella. Patella lesions are a dime a dozen. We see them all the time. Um, the first thing is making sure that that is the cause of their pain. So let's assume you believe that's the cause of their pain. They have swelling, they've been rehabbed, you're comfortable that everything else has been eliminated and they still have pain. Debridement with biopsy for young patients is my first line treatment. If, and I always open up the super patella pouch arthroscopically. If they get better with that, I ignore it. If they don't get better and they're very young, I do Macy with a TTO. If you wanna do marrow stimulation, keep in mind that a TTO or tibial tubal osteotomy is part of the routine treatment algorithm for treating symptomatic patella defects. The challenge is that you're giving them a sort of a half-hearted attempt at cartilage repair and you don't do the TTO because the cartilage repair is easy to do, they may not get better and the TTO may be more important than the marrow stimulation. So you have to keep in mind that a TTO or a tibial tubal osteotomy is an important decision-making point when you're treating patella defects, especially those that are central and distal and lateral. Um, my treatment for patellas in general that are symptomatic that fail debridement for young people is Macy. For middle age, older, or osteochondral lesions or revision treatment, it is osteochondral allograft. Two thirds of them get a tibial tubercle osteotomy. Okay, that's a general overview. Now, uh, turning to and very little marrow stimulation. Turning because I think they need a TTO. And if I'm going to go through a TTO, I want to give them a very good operation to treat their patella. And that's either going to be a Macy or an osteochondral allograft. Okay, turning to the OCD that has soft cartilage, I am not afraid to take a bank card elevator and open up that area and elevate it. If it is detached and you don't see and you see and you see a fissure and you can push on it, it is wishful thinking that drilling is going to make them better. If it is grossly unstable, but they have not violated the cartilage surface. I will take a bank art elevator and lacerate the cartilage surface and see if I can elevate that piece. If I cannot, and if I can elevate the piece, I keep it intact and hinged on one side. I curette the base and drill it. And I use metal headless screws. And I come back and I take them out at eight weeks. If on the other hand, I cannot elevate the piece and it is very, very stable. I drill through it and I drill from the side with a K wire and I use a biocomposite screw and I bury it and I will not come back and take that screw out. Okay. And yeah. that gives them more stability across the defect to dampen out the micro instability that they're feeling with load. 
Brian, any experience with ACI in particular legions? With ACI? ACI. Yeah. Say it again. Autologous contraceptive implantation. In patellar, patellar issue. Oh, patellar yeah. Lesions. Well, yeah, I've done over 600 of them and I'm a big fan for the right patients. So the question may be, how do I decide younger patients, superficial defects, primary treatment, multiple locations, delamination, patellofemoral, gears me more towards Macy. Older patients, revision treatment, osteochondral lesions, failed Macy, they get osteochondral allografts. That's my sort of overview of how I choose. Uh, Brian, uh, what is your take on impaction fractures which do happen when do you have uh, athletes coming with twisting injuries? How bad these impaction fractures uh, uh, do uh, in the follow-up phases? And is there a procedure when you do an arthroscopy, do you do something to these impaction injuries? So you're talking about in the setting of an ACL tear? Yeah, absolutely. Again, a uh, dime a dozen. It's like the uh, hill Sachs lesion with a shoulder instability. <coughs> How often are we treat those? Um, I, you know, while there is clearly some basic science preclinical work suggesting that they may go on to develop change, I'm not in the business of treating what's going to happen tomorrow. So uh, the answer is most of them do fine. Occasionally they come back. I debride them and I ignore them. Uh, are you still doing some kind of PRP uh, as a standalone procedure for your arthritic knees in your OPT? Yeah, I love it. I believe it's a dominant treatment strategy. I'm combining it with three injections of hyaluronic acid when I can. Uh, I think more is better. Three is reasonable. It costs money. Keep that in mind. Uh, pay insurance, at least in the United States, is not paying for it. But I believe it works. I, have, I believe it is a dominant treatment strategy for the treatment of osteoarthritis today of the knee. And what's the interval uh, roughly between the three injections? I do use, I use what, leukocyte rich, uh, seven to 10 days apart. Love to combine it with uh, uh, hyaluronic acid high molecular weight or complex uh, linking hyaluronic acid. So hyaluronic acid also you give every weekly? Yeah, around Correct. 10 days. Weekly. Weekly. Yeah. yeah, so I match the schedule for convenience. One perfect. needle, put it in. Okay, perfect. I think that's that's another take home point. Uh, are you doing some special uh, MR scans for your cartilage imaging? I mean, in India, we are a lot of these companies are pushing in to do special cartigrams. So uh, is our conventional MRE good enough or there are some special cartilage sequences which it should be dependent. You know, again, this is a philosophical answer. The harder you look for something, the more likely you're going to find it, right? Um, yeah. I think the reason the companies are pushing is because they want you to do, obviously, you know, more MRIs or other. Uh, I know that is not everyone agrees with me on this. You know, I ask you if you if you do. I don't want to get too philosophical, but much like uh, determining if you have IgG antibodies to COVID right? Or a coronavirus. Are you going to change your behavior? There's not enough evidence to tell you to change your behavior. Absolutely. Similarly, are you going to, if you get an MRI and show a signal change in the asymptomatic patient, we are not yet sophisticated enough to have disease modifying treatments. I'm not sure the value outside of research purposes to evaluate new technologies. The more sensitive the test, the more likely you are to find something. I, I just, you know, maybe it's my age, my years of experience. I've become much more pragmatic much more economically sensitive. I'm not looking for more to do. And uh, I'm certainly not more looking for more to treat in a patient who isn't having problems. We can always make them worse. And you got plenty of time to address their problems when they address it. In the absence of very clear cut clinical data showing we can alter the natural history of their disease. That's my answer. Perfect. Uh, you've done extensive research in cartilage. I mean, uh, Brian, is there any biomarker right now available or is there a pipeline which can predict that these patients are someone which are prone yeah. to arthritis and we can actually do something more aggressive on them? I would look at the Duke experience, Virginia Krauss and some other wonderful basic scientists uh, at what they're looking at. And we're, we're clearly getting there with serum uh, biomarkers. The biggest challenge is that the biomarkers are susceptible to the time of the day, the time of weight bearing status, and there's a tremendous amount of variability. So we struggle a bit there, but I would tell you that no question, there are um, uh, increasing evidence of biomarkers as using in our, as part of our armamentarium. We have a lot of research. We're taking biomarkers at time equals zero, collecting them over time to see how our interventions change biomarkers. But we are very clearly uh, interested in, the, in biomarkers in this regard. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you very much. I think, Brand, if, are there any qu more questions from the panel? Uh, so if there are no, I think, uh, Brand, it was wonderful. I think, Deepak, if you can Thanks. just maybe, yeah. 
yeah thank you brand that was a wonderful and thank you so much for sparing your time so early in the morning and before your clinics we are again grateful to you and the india on behalf of indian arthroscopy society and delhi arthroscopy course thank you once again i wish you and your families continued health and uh that we all emerge from this and see each other on the other side uh face to face god yeah, bless thank you thank, thank you, you brand it was indeed a very very it was indeed friends a very very uh, informative uh, experience talking to brand cole he has an extensive experience in cartilage and uh, his answers were uh, short and crisp and to the point uh, uh, we do have a, a wonderful meeting coming up tomorrow as well again courtesy to dr deepak choudhury uh, it's no other than dr freddy fu who is expert in anterior cruciate ligament surgery and his talk tomorrow and a master class is essentially on an individualized anatomical value based acl surgery uh, i would actually request everybody to put in the chat box as the meeting would progress tomorrow as well to put their questions so that we can use uh, the best of opportunity to get our answers straight from the people who have done extensive research in these fields thank you very much dr deepak choudhury thank you entire executive committee thank you thank you ips thank, thank you so much thank you sateesh thank you